Welcome to this webinar on making monoclonal antibodies broadly accessible, in particular to communities most at risk of HIV AIDS. My name is Roger Tatoud. I am Deputy Director at the International Health Society, where I lead the global HIV vaccine enterprise. This event is organized in partnership with IAV and follows the publication of a Welcome Trust report. On today's program, we will start with an interview of Mark Feinberg, President and CEO of IAV, by Professor Chloe Orkin, followed by a panel discussion with Q&A from the audience. I am now pleased to hand over to my colleague Hester Kuipers, Executive Director Europe at IAV. Thank you, Roger. Thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, we're really happy to have you and a special thank you to all the speakers and panelists for today's session. Uh, and we're very happy to be co-hosting this with the uh, International AIDS Society. So this session was conceived on the basis of a report that was published in August this year by Ayavi and Welcome that highlights the tremendous gap in access to monoclonal antibodies in lower middle income countries. And that is true for many marketed monoclonal antibodies, mostly for non-communicable diseases, but even the few antibodies that have been designed to combat infectious diseases that most impact people in low and middle income countries, the report has highlighted how access to those is still very limited. Um, the report includes an important call to action and a roadmap to address what uh, we found to be the key barriers to access across affordability and availability. And that report, uh, we believe, has tremendous uh, relevance for, for HIV AIDS because uh, we have a number of monoclonal antibodies, more than 20 in development, being evaluated for use as HIV prevention or HIV therapeutic modalities. And it is therefore imperative that we uh, clearly define a pathway on how those antibodies, once they've been found to be safe and effective, might become available for the people that are going to need them most particularly in low and middle income countries. And to give us uh, the first perspective, I'm keen to hand it over uh, to Professor Chloe Orkin. She is the lead for HIV, HIV Hep C and COVID research at Bart's Health NHS Trust in London and is the former chair of the British HIV AIDS Society. Thank you so much. And it's a real pleasure to be here and to introduce Mark Feinberg. Um, I'll give you a couple of words. I'm sure he's very, very, very well known to every single one of you. Um, but Mark is president and CEO of the International A uh, AIDS Vaccine Initiative, IRV, where he leads a global team working to advance the development of vaccines and other biomedical innovations to combat HIV, TB, and other infectious and neglected diseases that disproportionately impact low income countries. Mark spent 20 years exploring HIV pathogenesis, treatment, prevention research, and the biology of emerging diseases, and he worked both in academia and in government. Prior to joining IRV in late 2015, Mark served as Chief Public Health and Science Officer within Merck Vaccines. In this role, he helped advance the development and global availability of vaccine, vaccines against rotavirus, human papillomavirus, and other infectious diseases. So welcome, uh, welcome here today, Mark. It's wonderful to have you here, and it's a great pleasure to be able to interview you. So uh, let me ask you some questions. Uh, antibodies for HIV prevention and indeed for HIV treatment are still in an early stage of research. Why do you think it's important now that we consider access challenges at this time point? Well, thanks very much, Chloe, and thanks very much for the enterprise for um, hosting this webinar. I mean, I think one of the things I learned, you know, making the transition from academia to industry was just the mechanics of product development are more complicated and take more time than I, I appreciated in academia. And, you know, product development in industry is done with a so-called end-to-end view, where you actually have a very good idea about what your goal is, and you build all of the components of your development plan to, to meet that goal. I think the field of HIV, you know, prevention, as we all know, has been a very long and complicated one. And we're fortunately getting to the point where interventions are being shown to be efficacious. And, and that's just a tremendous advance. But interventions that are scientifically 
um, shown to be valid, but don't actually have a pathway of reaching people who need it are going to be, um, you know, disappointing and frustrating for all of us. And, you know, we can't just wait to get an efficacy signal before we put in place a clear pathway where we detail all of the steps that are going to need to be uh, traveled in order to get to a, a product that can actually reach people who are at highest risk of HIV infection and have the desired uh, impact on um, the epidemic. You know, we can't, it, it would take too long to just wait to get an efficacy uh, signal before we actually begin to put plans in place about how we're actually going to get these interventions to people who need them. And what was clear from the report um, and call to action that the Wellcome Trust and NIAVI work together on, um, there's so much work to do, not just on the scientific front, but also on the policy front, uh, the delivery front, and the business model front, if we're going to achieve that goal. So while the great science like the AMP trial that you'll hear more about from Mike Cohen um, is advancing in really positive um, ways, we need to be prepared for success. We can't wait to get the answer from those studies or follow on studies in order to put in place mechanisms and, and procedures now uh, to ensure success. Thank you so much. And what would you think would be the very first steps that we need to put into place? Well, I think, yeah, no, it's a really good question. I mean, I actually think it's a, the first step is actually having an integrated plan of all the different components that are going to be necessary for success, because there are, you know, scientific ones, you know, what are the scientific characteristics needed to have a highly efficacious product that could prevent infection with diverse viral variants. Then there's the issue about product characteristics, you know, can we actually produce that in a, you know, an appropriate uh, level of um, supply? Can we formulate it in a way that would promote acceptable delivery that could be accommodated by healthcare systems in resource limited settings? Can we make it affordable enough? How is it going to compare with other interventions? You know, we know, fortunately, there's been progress being made on small molecules, antiretroviral drugs for HIV prevention. And I think the world will likely need multiple modalities if we're going to meet the needs of everyone. But you know, we need to be able to have it be affordable. It needs to be delivered in a product profile that's going to be accessible for the target populations. And you know, in order to accomplish those things, we need to lay out very focused um, pathways, not just in the science, the technical, the policy and the business model fronts um, in order to be successful. As you know very well, you know, HIV, you know, the global response to HIV transformed the way that the world thinks about access to innovative medicines and, and the ability to make antiretroviral ther therapies affordable and widely available in low-income countries is a real triumph, but it's going to be harder to accomplish that same goal with monoclonal antibodies just because they're you know, technically more complicated to produce. There's not the equivalent of generic um, you know, antiretroviral drugs for monoclonal antibodies. So we're going to need to, again, forge new territory if we're going to achieve global access in an equitable and affordable way to monoclonal antibodies for HIV prevention and possibly treatment. Okay. And I think, you know, that, that, that framework, the way you've broken it down into the different strands that one has to look at, you know, the, the sort of the product characteristics, the business model, the policy, really breaks it down and makes it more understandable in terms of what those concrete steps might be. But do you feel that if we were, to, if we, you know, if, if as a, you know, global community, we were to start taking those steps, it would be feasible to actually drive down the costs of monoclonal antibodies? Well, I'm, you know, fundamentally an optimist. I think anyone who works in the HIV field is fundamentally an optimist. Um, and, and I think the answer to that is, you know, my hypothesis is that the answer is yes, but we have a number of different steps to take in order to achieve that goal. And, and I do think it will require progress in a number of different steps. You know, we know that there are emerging technologies that, um, can make monoclonal antibodies more affordable. We in the HIV field have, you know, 
identified multiple, you know, throughout uh, the scientific community, multiple broadly neutralizing antibodies that, you know, a number of them have very high levels of potency. And the more potent an antibody is, the lower the dose that will be needed. Um, I think we have a growing appreciation of the number of antibodies that will be needed. And there are emerging, um, you know, partnerships and policy um, pathways that are beginning to be um, developed. And, and Aaron uh, Sparrow may want to comment about that. But even at the WHO level, until relatively recently, um, this there hasn't been a policy framework akin to WHO prequalification for vaccines and other drugs for monoclonal antibodies. That's you know starting to change, and there's an ongoing activity even you know just this week around a preferred product characteristic or so-called target product profile that would be important to guide the development um, efforts and help frame what that pathway would look like. Um, you know when we started working with Welcome on. The report we thought that HIV would be the vanguard, you know, for enabling global access to monoclonal antibodies. You know, lo and behold, you know, none of us could have anticipated the COVID nineteen pandemic. But given the role of monoclonal antibodies for COVID treatment and possibly prevention, it's pretty clear that it's likely that COVID will actually be the test case that you know demonstrates whether we can answer your question and deliver affordable monoclonal antibodies and make them available in a suitable product profile for introduction in low and middle income countries. Yeah, that's a really interesting point um, and uh, particularly interesting to me because I'm about to start as one, of, as one of the principal investigators for one of the post-exposure post prophylaxis COVID monoclonal antibody studies. So it really is germane to, to what I'm sort of dealing with at the moment. Um, so I guess a question for you, um, sort of two linked questions. Do you think there'll be specific additional barriers uh, in terms of accessing monoclonal antibodies for HIV prevention rather than treatment. And given the role of the community in pushing forward on PrEP, what do you think the community can do to really help to drive this process? Yeah, well, I think there you know, will be a number of very, I mean, my own view is that monoclonal antibodies may have their greatest value in prevention. I mean, we already, as you know, have very good drugs for, for treatment and, and those continue to get better in you know, impressive ways. Um, you know, but what we need for you know, prevention is I think everyone on the webinar knows are products that are not only efficacious, but have characteristics that will make people want to use them. Because if, if they don't use them, as we know, it's not going to be um, effective in, in practice. So understanding um, you know, what the product profiles are that would promote optimal acceptability. And there are some you know, benefits of the monoclonal antibody approach. You know, conceivably, it could be administered by subcutaneous administration um, with you know, mutations to the antibodies that promote longer half-life. They could potentially be administered infrequently, say once every four to six months. Um, it would be discreet so that no one would need to know that someone was actually using the product for prevention, which we know is an important consideration. So there are a number of benefits of the antibodies, but just because we're all optimists about the antibodies doesn't mean that they're going to be possible to implement it successfully in practice. And we need to actually not just think we know the answer to your question, we need to actually do the work now to sort of clarify what is the pathway? What are obstacles? What can we do to minimize those obstacles um, now? And how, so two questions, how can the community um, in terms of activism help with this? And I guess a question to you, I'm a treating HIV physician, that's what I do. Um, and there are still, you know, one to 5% of the population in sort of the US anyway, with very hard to treat virus. And these antibodies could play a very vital role. These six monthly, you know, mutated antibodies could play a vital role for these people. And it's how we make sure that these people are not left behind. They're a small cohort. They're the people who've borne the brunt of our learning and of our antiretroviral journey. Yeah. Um, you know, so what role can the community play really to ensure these antibodies not for prevention and for these individuals? Yeah. Well, with respect to the first question, I think, you know, as with everything else we've learned in the HIV 
response. You know, we need to engage communities so that they're, we understand their voices, what they view about uh, prevention modalities that would fit well in their lives and with their preferences. Um, we also need to educate them about the science. Um, you know, Mike and others who were involved in the AMP trial might, you know, talk about some of the work they did to raise understanding of the community of, you know, people volunteering for those studies, because I think that provides, you know, a first step for understanding how to raise awareness more broadly. And I, I think the, the message, you know, here needs to be defined and, and we need to do that with input from the community about what information is necessary, what's going to be most valuable, what's going to resonate. With respect to treatment, my earlier comments weren't to um, suggest that there's not a role for the antibodies in treatment. I mean, as you know, and I think many, if not everyone on the webinar knows, there is a significant interest in antibodies for treatment as well as potentially as part of a regimen that might pursue uh, curative um, endpoints. And I think that's still an area of important, you know, scientific opportunity. I think, um, you know, we are fortunate to have now a very detailed understanding of the biology of the virus and the opportunity to, you know, intervene at, at various stages of the life cycle. And I think monoclonal antibodies could potentially be very promising opportunities as well for the subset of individuals that you refer to who are not responding to other um, existing medications. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think that we can see that the, you know, the potential of this product, something that can go full circle in terms of the whole continuum of HIV care is clearly very important uh, that we should all have access to it. And, and I would hope that in the same way as in PrEP and in early antiretrovirals, the community will really be at the vanguard of this um, and that we will learn from them in terms of how to fight for this and how to make sure that this happens. So thank you so much. It was really interesting and I really enjoyed talking to you. And I'd like to hand over to Roger now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Chloe. Thank you very much, Mark. This was a very interesting uh, discussion. And um, we are now going to move on the panel discussion and I'm going to ask all the panelists to switch on their camera so that we can see them. Thank you. So today on uh, panel, we brought you uh, Mike Cohen, Director of the Institute of uh, Global Health and Infectious Disease at UNC School of Medicine, Helen Rees, Executive Director of the WITS Reproductive Health and HIV Institute at the University of Witswatersrand in South Africa, Rosemary Mburu, Executive Director of WASI Health in Kenya, Erin Sparrow, Technical Officer, Vaccine Product and Delivery Research Immunization, Vaccine and Biologic Loss at the WHO, uh, Pervin Anklesaria, apologies if I mispronounce your name, Senior Program Officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates, and uh, Bill Snow, uh, whom everybody knows, and who previously was uh, leading the enterprise, and it's great to have you today, Bill. Uh, thank you all for uh, being on this panel today. Uh, we're going to have about 40 minutes of uh, question. Uh, I remind the attendees that you can ask your question in the Q&A box. This is the bubble icon at the bottom of your screen. There are already a few questions in this box, which our panelists can also see and may wish to answer online if they fit with one of the questions we're going to ask or in addition, and they can also be answered directly online. I am now going to hand over to Esther to uh, open the panel discussion with the first question. And I know that Mark may have to leave at some point. So thank you in advance, Mark. Thanks, Roger. And, and Mark, while we have you, maybe I go slightly off script and actually ask the first question to you that was raised uh, uh, by the audience. And that relates, to, uh, the, the question is the following, Mark. Uh, since it looked like we will have uh, COVID-19 vaccines and may still be far off uh, achieving an effective HIV vaccine, do you think this alters the relative need for monoclonal antibodies for prevention between these two pandemics? Well, I think there are likely to be roles for antibodies in both instances. Um, certainly in the COVID case, the, they have uh, demonstrated benefit, at least in the treatment of early to mild disease. And I think you know, we'll have to see whether opportunities to intervene in the later stages of the disease might also include monoclonal antibodies. Um, I think, you know, the advent of efficacious vaccines, which is great news for COVID, you know, might potentially diminish 
the role for monoclonal antibodies, but it's quite likely that there may be additional roles even in the context of a vaccine, you know, whether that's for people who might be less um, able to respond to a vaccine either you know, because of some pre-existing medical condition or some other factor that we don't fully appreciate yet, as well as um, you know, one wants to actually take a public health approach to get going after the COVID pandemic, and that might include both um, you know, vaccine-mediated protection as well as other um, protection, whether that's monoclonal antibodies um, or even potentially small molecule drugs on the horizon, we'll just have to see. But you need multiple modalities. I think that's also true for HIV. You know, clearly there are multiple modalities being advanced for HIV prevention, and we need to figure out how they're all going to be developed simultaneously and how we're going to deploy them potentially for their maximum benefit. But I, I think many of us on the phone believe that the promise of monoclonal antibodies for HIV prevention is such as that we definitely need it to give it our best uh, shot at making sure that we fully evaluate it. And if it's shown to be efficacious, do our best to make it widely available. And I think quite likely we're going to need multiple different prevention interventions to have the desired impact on the AIDS pandemic that we all um, seek. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm going to turn to you then, Mike, for the for the first question, and it was alluded to a, a few times. Uh, the the antibody mediated prevention studies uh, um, that is evaluating the role of monoclonals. Uh, as passive immunity for HIV prevention. I think many of us on the call will know about it and we're anticipating and hope to, to hear about the results soon. It is a proof of concept study and I wonder if you could run us a little bit through what we might learn from the study, what the different scenarios of outcomes might be and how that would inform uh, the ongoing efforts uh, to, to assess monoclonal antibodies for HIV prevention. <coughs> Thanks. Um, I, I guess I guess I'm going to take a more macroscopic view at first, uh, benefiting from Mark's kind of erudite, really smart comments. And first, you know, thanking Mark and a lot of other people for their work in kind of pushing uh, the envelope uh, of, of more and more prevention efforts. Then there's a disclaimer that like the HIV prevention people like me have also been turned to COVIDologists. We also have become COVIDology prevention people. And, and so when you take the biggest view, we, and I, the third disclaimer is that I, I, I helped to run the HI, NIH HIV Prevention Trials Network, which is now also the COVID Prevention Trials Network. So, so these things are overlapping in so many ways, it's almost impossible without giving a pretty long, not long-winded, but a answer that's two or three paragraphs. So it's gonna be a two or three word paragraph. I'm not, like, a, like on television, I'm not gonna really answer your question at first. I promise I'll answer your question, but first I have to give the bigger picture. The bigger picture is, that we really have, um, we always are talking about integrated strategies and we always have behavior as part of what we need to do. It, for HIV, it's been behavior changes that are essential to try and save for sex behavior. For COVID, countries that are doing well have incredible, great, safer behaviors and countries that are doing terribly have terrible behaviors. So there is a behavioral component of this. And even when we develop biological tools, there's another big behavioral component of who's gonna benefit, who's gonna access these biological tools above and beyond price and everything else. So, so for the biological tools for, for HIV, we have the one that's you know, become so in, in, embedded, the use of antivirals for treatment as prevention. And, and we're gonna see the same thing in COVID very quickly, that early treatment of COVID is going to probably be treatment as prevention for COVID. And the second tool we have, which is magically important, is a vaccine. And for almost everyone on this call, there's been an effort to make a vaccine for HIV. And it's interesting, it's been proven very, very difficult. As the COVIDologists were invented, one of the big criticisms for the involvement of HIV people was, you're going to involve HIV people in COVID vaccine development? Is that a good idea? That was one of the you know, kind of hallmark criticisms. But either way, COVID vaccines are moving much more much more quickly than, than HIV vaccines have moved because of the difference in the biology of the agents. And the third issue, the issue we're supposed to talk about right now is about passive immunity of monoclonal antibodies. And, and I would first point out that, and Mark has played a big role in, in, in this field as of others on this call, but the ability to make 
COVID monoclonal antibodies is not independent of the massive effort to understand HIV virology and broad neutralizing antibodies. So th these are not independent. We would not be making COVID monoclonal antibodies had we not devoted 20 years to understanding broad neutralizing antibodies. And, and this whole movement of monoclonal antibodies and in infectious diseases is entirely dependent on HIV uh, uh, science over many, many years. So it would be impossible to ignore fantastic scientists that don't get credit for all that they've done. Having said that, <clears throat> then we have broad neutralizing antibodies as Mark pointed out. And then you have to say, well, why would you bother with these when you have so many antivirals? You have antiviral pills, and now we have antiviral injections. And, and the point about these small molecule antivirals is that either they take daily um, pill taking behavior, or in the case of our very popular and important drug cavitegravir injection, it's every two months. And so always our thinking was, if we had a monoclonal or a, a group of monoclonals that were broad, broadly neutralizing, we could give them maybe every six months or maybe even longer because you know how to modify these molecules. So for people at highest risk, we could create an environment where they have a pseudo vaccine. If people are willing to take uh, influenza vaccine every year, for risk of influenza, maybe the highest risk people in HIV would be willing to take a monoclonal cocktail every year. Um, and, and that's kind of the thinking here, the competitive thinking that Mark already alluded to of multiple opportunities, uh, shots on goal, like using the, the hockey analogy. So that brings us to the AMP trial. So now I'm gonna to get to your question. That, that I apologize for that incredibly long three paragraph introduction to your question. Okay, so about, six years ago when broad neutralizing antibodies are only uh, about uh, really really realistically 10 12 years old about six years ago we decided to ask a question could you safely administer these anti-infective monoclonals either for treatment or prevention w would they be safe that's the very first thing televisions filled with monoclonals for cancer and inflammation which have a million um, warnings Anti-infective monoclonals are not the same. They're directed at the pathogen and not the host. And that's a really important concept. So the first issue was, could we safely give these anti 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 monoclonals? Second is, would, would people take them? Would we would be able to enroll subjects who would get infusions and keep coming back for their infusions? And third, would could we see whether they were effect, efficacious? That is, could they prevent some degree of HIV infection as prophylaxis, as pre-exposure prophylaxis, the same PrEP idea as everyone's already familiar with. And, and lastly, would we learn a ton of biology from this and help to develop surrogates for the vaccine field? Because if we could make a, a, a broad neutralizing antibody or cocktail antibodies that prevent HIV, it gives a target for the vaccine field. It gives this a, a correlative immunity that would be absolute. So we did all, we, this was all our thinking. So then uh, with the help of, of, through the support of the NIH and the NIH Vaccine Research Center, we took one antibody, VRCO1. It's not the best antibody. It's not the most potent antibody. It's not the most wonderful antibody, but it was the only antibody that could be made in the concentration necessary for a, a really big trial 10 years ago. And so we had to make a decision. And the decision was, are we gonna do a trial now and push this envelope? Or are we gonna wait till somebody makes the world's most super duper antibody? We made a decision. We were gonna do one antibody in the biggest trial we could do. So we enrolled 4,693 subjects into this trial. The trial let them receive, uh, subjects received um, two different doses of antibody or placebo every eight weeks for uh, uh, more than, I think it was for a, a total of 10, 10 injections, 80 weeks. We then continue to follow subjects for another 24 weeks. We have 104 weeks of follow-up. And then there's like the two amazing things I can share with you. Um, this was entirely safe. We didn't see any of these off-target effects that you, know, you wouldn't wanna see. It's a very safe antibody. And I think that's well known. We wouldn't have continued for all these years if it wasn't safe. And, and people loved their antibodies. We had like 99% retention. And it was like, we in fact had to launch a whole behavioral unit to understand why people love these antibodies so much, why they love these infusions. No one quit. So at the end of the study, we had all these subjects followed for all this period of time. 
Now, the study is, is finished and we're about to publish the results. And then you say, well, why don't you just tell us the results? And the reason I'm not telling you the results today is not because of some nefarious secret, it's because we haven't had a chance to communicate the results, all the results to the study subjects. 4,693 people stayed with us for 104 months, uh, weeks, I'm sorry, 104 weeks. So therefore we need to communicate to them everything we learned to the community in a way that makes sense in a very, very complicated study. Um, having said that, I will say this. There's no doubt that the study achieved its goals and we learned what we thought we would learn. There's no doubt that it served the purposes of proof of concept. There's no doubt. So those, those are unequivocal things that when we, these results will show that we learned what we thought we would learn. We learned a lot about the biology of HIV infection. We learned a lot about monoclonal antibodies. We learned, I, we think the path forward. Um, and and, and in, in summary, the path forward is the one that Mark decided was the right path before we ever started the study. Um, and that is, or Mark and others, not, not to focus entirely on him. It's like, wait, in order to really use this as an alternative to a small molecule, you're gonna probably need to combine several antibodies. Either, either you're gonna find the world's most perfect, greatest monoclonal antibody, or you're gonna need to combine antibodies. And there's two ways that we can combine antibodies. One way is we can just take two, three, four, whatever number of antibodies and get the most potent antibodies and put them together into one infusion or injection. And the other way is what Sanofi's trying to do. They're, they're seeing what is required of the antibody and engineering the world's most super duper homemade monoclonal antibody. And other companies are trying to do the same thing. So I'm gonna stop and say, okay, the AMP study was the proof of concept that human beings could safely receive a monoclonal antibody called VRCO1, and that it would inform us about the best way forward, that the general idea is the right, is an idea that would be an alternative to an injectable prevention or a pill injection. I, I believe that's to be the case. And I believe that the way forward in summary, I'll just reiterate it is to, to and, and I think there's a pretty big commitment on the part of NIH and others, uh, foundations to go forward, to pursue this as an alternative. And then you have to say again, the reason why is the hope that we can create something that will last a very long period of time as passive immunity in the absence of a vaccine. Now, one, one last word about COVID. All this HIV stuff completely involved, informed COVID. Uh, and, and by way of, again, disclaimer, uh, our NIH COVID prevention network has been heavily involved with Lilly and Regeneron in their treatment studies, which have now received uh, authorization for early treatment and in two prevention studies that are again informed by everything else we've done. One prevention studies in skilled nursing facilities, the other prevention studies in households. Both studies are moving along very quickly. And again, that same exact purpose. Can we not compete with vaccines? Can we understand vaccines better through passive immunity? So there is an incredibly long-winded answer for which I, that's the longest sentence in the history of the world. I apologize, I'll stop. No need to apologize, Mark, thank you. That is, uh... Thank you for outlining that. It, it sounds very encouraging, and I know many of us were really looking forward to to seeing uh, to seeing the results out. And, and I think it's wonderful that uh, you know that this study was conducted, and it's going to, I think, create a wealth of information for the for the path forward for monoclonals. So, so thank you for outlining that. And it's 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 perhaps a, a good segue, and, and we will come back to you, Mike, but to to hear from Aaron, um, who who was a part, and I think Mark mentioned it. A part of a workshop that took place uh, last week on on uh, preferred product characteristics for HIV antibodies, and 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 Erin, I think the question uh, from us is, you know, if if monoclonals prove to be safe and effective for HIV prevention, what would be some of the key uh, product characteristics that would be needed to make them viable uh, for use and access in low middle income countries? Could you share a little bit some of the learnings? from the session last week? Sure, so I think I'll, I'll jump straight in and say that it, the, the route of administration is really important. And I think that's amazing that they had in the AMP trials a retention of all what was at 4,693 participants to receive intravenous infusion 10 times. Um, that's that's amazing. I the, the discussion that we had on Friday, which we brought um, several stakeholders around um, the table to discuss, uh, one of the um, characteristics was the route of administration. And I think most people feel that intravenous is not the way to go for developing countries. 
Um, maybe in specific populations it, it could be feasible, but for any wide um, use, an intramuscular or subcutaneous uh, injection is just far simpler to deliver, not only for the healthcare workers, but also for patient acceptability. Um, so I would start with that, and I would say that that's kind of a, a characteristic which would be very much preferred. Uh, related to that is therefore the dose, because there's only so much antibody that can be delivered via that route. You, can, you can't, you know, put grams of, of, of antibody into somebody's arm and expect um, it not to be extremely painful. Um, so any ways to bring down that dose would then um, help uh, that route of administration to be actually feasible. Which actually brings me to the second point, which is the price. And for these products to be widely used, they need to be affordable. Monoclonal antibodies are expensive to produce, and that um, is really dependent on the amount of antibody in terms of grams that are in any of these products. It's because they use mammalian cell culture mainly, so Cho cell lines are, are the preferred method for producing monoclonal antibodies. And all of the media fills that go into this, the protein A, it's, it is so expensive um, that even with you know innovative bioreactors where you sort of have continuous flow go, um, going, you know at best they might be able to achieve fifty dollars per gram. But current prices are around at high scale production are around one hundred US dollars per gram to produce uh, a monoclonal antibody. So looking at ways to have alternative cell lines that might be cheaper, such, such as yeast expression systems. And I know the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are funding um, some groups to look at this in very early um, development. New expression systems would actually bring down the cost of these um, of production, but these are a decade away because with any protein, when you're, when you're doing um, expression of a protein, there's glycosylation and using a completely, you know, a fungal system to express, you don't know what the what the protein folding is going to look like. And that could impact the safety and efficacy, which is why people have always chosen um, uh, mammalian cells. So if they, can, if they can find a way to bring down the dose, then that brings down the costs. And that can either be achieved through a new expression system, which may be decades away, or um, as was mentioned previously, by increasing the potency binding affinity of the products, extending the half-life. So you can achieve six months six months of protection instead of two months. All of those things will need to be solved, I think, in order to have these products um, widely available for, for developing country use. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. And and um, Roche, I'll look at you if, if how we're doing for time, but I think that I would be keen to ask Mike or Mark indeed, in terms of the ability to um, generate those improved Antibodies. So, if we focus then on the on the ability to improve the antibodies per se, rather than the the uh, expression mechanisms for manufacturing, is that something? Because uh, because Aaron mentioned the ten year time frame on on optimizing the expression system. Would we, in terms of optimizing antibodies, is that something that we could achieve um, sooner, earlier? Do, uh, Mark and I might have, do, Mark, do you want, I'll give a really quick answer and Mark will give an answer. Really quick. I would say one thing that you need that needs to be realized. People don't stop looking. So one of the issues is, is the con okay, first in terms of concentration, Aaron very nicely pointed out that they're looking for, more, and Mark did too, more potent antibodies, i.e. the smallest concentration. Remember in COVID, the company is already de-escalating their antibodies. Eli Lilly gave 7,000 milligrams uh, as their antibody for treatment, and now it's 700 milligrams. And they have other things further de-escalating that are a little more confidential. So de-escalating the dose is a really important thing that can happen. Second, people don't stop looking for the world's most super duper antibody. That is, there's 83 mono COVID monoclonal antibodies. Everybody in the world has their own, Mark has unlimited numbers of broad neutralizing antibodies for, for HIV. They're always looking for the world's best antibody. And I just got an abstract uh, for a meeting of, we have the world's best HIV antibody, meaning now it takes a smidgen instead of a smudge of this antibody. So, so there are on the proximal side, not the production side, the proximal side is a lot of reason to be optimistic. Third, I'll go back to Sanofi. If they're able to actually manufacture a safe product that embraces what antibodies do because of the science, 
kind of you're done worrying about some of the price issue because I think it'll be a lot cheaper if they have their own super duper single antibody that they can manufacture in giant bio uh, reactors. So uh, Mark is the world's expert, but that shouldn't stop me from preempting his comments. Well, I'm definitely not the world's expert. And you, uh, I thought, gave a lot of you know valuable information in those comments. I mean, you know, Mike had already highlighted that they did the AMP trial with the VRCO1 antibody because they felt it would be good enough to answer the fundamental question um, that they were asking, which it sounds like it, it, it was, which is um, you know, very encouraging news, but it's important to note that there are antibodies that are, you know, hundreds of times more potent than VRCO1 that have been discovered subsequently, and there are combinations that a range of investigators have identified that cover the vast majority, you know, close to 99% or so of circulating HIV, you know, variants, which is a step forward technically um, you know, Aaron's comments about cost of production um, and, and new technologies um, are very important. Um, you know, we are hopeful um, to actually push that, the limits of that and see how low we can drive the price down. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I think this will happen first in the COVID antibody um, space. Um, it may be a simpler one than HIV. We don't yet know whether one antibody will suffice for COVID treatment and prevention, or whether in the case of HIV, you might need more, but we'll you know, know the answer at least for one or two antibodies about how affordably it can be. And, and there are you know, a number of ways of making the product affordable. At the end of the day, the price of the product is really needs to be considered in the context of what the delivery uh, program needs to be, and that includes all the costs in the healthcare system. And if you can actually get to a point where um, you do have once every six months delivery with a limited dose, you know, hopefully that would be cost effective, but we don't know that answer now. We just have to do everything we can to make it as affordable as possible with the optimal uh, product characteristics as Aaron was was describing I, you know again hiv is going to be a test case i think covid will even you know put it to the test even sooner but you know we'll see i mean this isn't an abstract question that we won't know the answer to i think within the next year we'll have a much better understanding of how affordably we can make products like monoclonal antibodies as it relates to access in the world's uh, uh, most uh, impoverished countries Thanks, Mark and Mike. Uh, Roche, I'm yes, turn it uh, back to you. Th thank you, Esther. I'd like to bring in uh, Rosemary. We've heard from, from Mike how important the community's involvement and contribution was in the AM studies and how they, they really like to be part of the study. And it's something we heard at CASA also last year. From your perspective, what's the level of awareness of this approach as a potential new prevention tool? What, what do you think are the critical point or aspect from the community perspective in, into the use of this? And, and how, do we, uh, what do you, how do you see the role of the community in the future development of such technology? Thank you so much for that question. When I was reflecting upon this question on awareness, um, I was thinking about two uh, categories of stakeholders. And as you have rightly put, there is the community and civil society as a, as a community of stakeholders. And then, you, uh, and this stake, group of stakeholders influence demand. And that is what um, will really drive demand. And then you have another category of stakeholders who will influence uh, supply. And, and they are all very important. Coming to communities and civil society and how their engagement, involvement, and understanding uh, will involve, <coughs> will influence demand. My reflection is that um, you have um, a moderately good understanding and awareness, especially among advocates, when you talk about prevention advocates, when you talk about treatment advocates. So those of us who are involved and engaged in this space, we have been following the science, we have been listening, we have been reading the documents, but the broader civil society and communities do not necessarily engage in this space and engage with science the way those of us in, uh, engaged in prevention science uh, and advocacy are involved and engaged. 
And therefore, one of the, the things and the concerns we have heard, uh, and actually not only from the broader community of civil society and advocates, but also uh, among ourselves as prevention advocates or advocates for, uh, for science, is um, the extent to which we are communicating or not communicating, for example, where the antibodies are coming from. Those are questions I have heard in terms of even the difference between human antibodies, animal antibodies. So these are questions you will hear which continue to um, drive the um, conversation around anti-vaccination, et cetera, et cetera. And it really does affect how communities and civil society actually perceive um, uh, the perceive science and the intended uh, outcome, product, and intervention. It is also very much connected to the supplier side because when we are talking about access, it's not just about civil society, it's not just about community understanding and awareness and appreciation of the science, but it is also the extent to which uh, the countries are, are ready or getting ready. So when we finally have a product, how will it move at the country level? Within that, I'm thinking about uh, the policymakers. I'm thinking about the, the regulators. I'm thinking about uh, the investments. And so for us as communities, much as we, 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 uh, we use our voice, advocate uh, for the science and implementation of it at the country level, that has to go hand in hand with creation of awareness among the decision makers. When you think about the barriers, to access, we are thinking about is there enough resources allocated and invested for the uptake of this? We are thinking about um, the essential medicine lists, for example, to what extent will countries be prepared um, and ready to walk that journey in terms of updating the, the country guidelines, in terms of updating the essential medicines list? Um, to what extent will we, uh, the delays around regulation, approvals, et cetera, et cetera. And those will all be very important for us as, as communities, as, as we partner in this, as advocates, as we um, uh, push and utilize our voice and know-how for access. Those are elements that will need to go hand in hand with, with our voice and it ties actually to, to also a question around how um, do communities actually perceive it all? How do communities perceive um, passive immunization? I think it goes back to the question of the extent to which communities are meaningfully engaged at the moment. And, and Mark, you did mention that we will have to be very intentional on how we build structures for community engagement, community consultations. And when you look at the characteristics that Erin, you are, you are mentioning, you know, very, very important, you know, the, are they small doses or big doses? Uh, is it an injection or an intravenous? And a lot of the times it is very important to think about also the sociocultural uh, elements and components um, that, that actually needs to also inform those characteristics that are very unique uh, country by country, but more so for lower and middle income countries. So just thinking about how do we uh, bring in a very comprehensive uh, community engagement plan that helps to shape the way we think about the new science and how we prepare ourselves for the uptake, but also how we prepare ourselves for advocacy at the country level for the uptake of the interventions. And, and thank you very much. All, all great points, and, and thank you for, for making my chairing easier because now I can bring, I'll come back to Erin and the question of the essential uh, um, medicine list. But I, now I can jump to, to, to Helen, and, and Helen, could, could you answer this, this question regarding you know, regulatory hurdle or approval and integration in existing prevention? Uh, for in, in a low and middle income country. And, and of course, if at any time any panelists would want to join to, 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 to react, please wave your hand and we will uh, give, give you the, the mic. So back to you, Helen. No, so thank you for that. Um, and, and to just contextualize why I'm going to talk about regulators because I chair the, the board of the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority. So I'll, that's, that's why I've been asked this question. 
Um, I think the first thing to say is that um, regulators are, are very familiar with, with, this, with the field, but in many low middle income countries, there haven't been very many products that have been brought forward uh, because they are too expensive and they're seen as products that would probably benefit only a few. And also commercially, it's not, there's not a big market. So there's not necessarily been interest. But one thing that COVID has, has definitely done is to create real prominence uh, to monoclonal antibodies and what their potential role could be. Um, and hand in hand with that, um, we were already seeing uh, in, in terms of regulatory authorities worldwide, new efforts to, to do what's called reliance, where we start to share information, we start assess, we share assessments with uh, better resourced regulatory authorities and less well resourced regulatory authorities. And in the African region, there is a, a body that includes all the regulatory authorities from the African region called AVAREF that uh, was actually really came into prominence because of Ebola clinical trials so that people start to look at things together. So there is a movement worldwide, or there was even before COVID to try and get this sort of regulatory harmonization and dialogue. And, and COVID has really fast tracked that. But, but I, I think that uh, in, in terms of this kind of technology, which is, is new, many less well-resourced regulatory authorities wouldn't necessarily have the expertise to really understand. And the, probably the people in the their countries who would understand and be able to really have in-depth um, insight, say, into a clinical trial and a product would be the very people who would be doing the trials. So, so I think um, putting all of this together, um, we do need to have, um, we do need to really uh, build on what we've seen for COVID, what we've been seeing prior to that in uh, low middle income countries, which is that we need to open up dialogue so that the kind of expertise that is, you know, huge in a group like the FDA or EMA um, can be shared. The WHO pre-qualification process does this, it shares it shares both between low middle income countries and, and better resourced regulators. So, so you know, regulation is, is going to be very, very important. Um, and it's going to be important so that we don't get people put, just putting up barriers because this is an unfamiliar product. Thank you very much. In, in terms of, um, if we imagine that this product becomes available, would you target particular population first? Would you prioritize this intervention? Well, it, 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 the answer is, is uh, it's, it's, you, you're going to prioritize, if you're in a country, you're going to prioritize people at highest risk. Um, and that will vary from country to country as to what is your population that really represents that highest risk. And in fact, at the Erin, uh, I was in the same consultation with Erin last week where we were looking at this. Um, and basically it's, it's every population that's at highest risk. And for those of us working in the HIV field, we're, we're familiar with it, but it started with cisgender women and men, men who have sex with men, transgender individuals, people who inject drugs, and, and it went on. But I think importantly, there are some other groups here that that's in terms of sexual uh, risk, but there are other groups here that, that uh, people might not be so familiar with. And those are uh, neonates and infants who, at, who have been exposed. Um, and pregnant and breastfeeding women as well. So, so there are some unique groups where we would probably be looking for slightly different products. We would have to have different clinical trials, but who might well really benefit from um, access to an affordable uh, monoclonal antibody. Thank you, Ren, and thank you for bringing in the uh, earlier generation in a way, which, which um, I'm going to go back to Irene and, and this uh, question around the inclusion uh, in the WHO essential medicine list and uh, consideration in the pre-qualification process, which are both important uh, enabler for access to innovation, especially in low and middle income country. What's the process for the WHO to, to consider the inclusion of monoclonal antibody uh, in the essential medicine list and pre-qualification? So they're, they're two separate um, activities at WHO and I'll start with the essential medicines list. Um, to date, there are a few monoclonal antibodies that are already on the essential medicines list. 
And um, these are all sort of, um, you know, chronic disease antibodies, such as uh, Herceptin or Trastuzumab, which is given for HER2 positive breast cancer. Um, to date, there has not been a single infectious disease monoclonal antibody included on the essential medicines list. Um, but that is, I guess, because there are so few of them. Um, we are actually in the process um, or planning to submit an application to include rabies monoclonal antibodies on the list. Um, because we now have two products that are approved in India. And these would um, augment the supply of the blood-derived rabies immunoglobulin, which is usually derived from um, horses who have been hyperimmunized hyper with rabies vaccine, to be given post-exposure prophylaxis injected directly into the wound to neutralize any residual virus um, at, the, at the wound site for, for rabies post-exposure prophylaxis. So that would be the first monoclonal antibody for an infectious disease that hopefully makes it on the essential medicines list. And the purpose of that list is really to present to countries to say these are the minimum um, list of medications or other, you know, it includes everything from fluoride toothpaste to these really uh, complex um, uh, proteins like monoclonal antibodies, but to say this is what the minimum amount of um, drugs and other health products that you should be making available to your populations at affordable prices. Um, so I think that the rabies um, will be a, a good one to get on there and that will hopefully pave the, pave the way for other ones such as respiratory syncytial virus, these long acting monoclonals that are now in development. Um, the second is WHO prequalification. Um, and WHO does not need to pre-qualify pre, um, pre everything under the sun. That, that's not the goal of WHO. The purpose of pre-qualification is really to allow UN agencies or agencies such as the Global Fund or GAVI um, to procure um, uh, products that have been um, produced in countries that may not have the most stringent regulatory authority. Um, so it really provides a, a sort of a level um, playing field for the, the products, the vaccines that are produced in India to say that they are equally um, as um, efficacious and safe as the products produced in, in Europe. Um, and uh, for um, such products for HIV um, prophylaxis, then there would definitely be a need for a WHO pre-qualification because there is global fund procurement of these uh, products. Um, or other, you know, Unitaid, these, these kind of groups that are procuring HIV prevention um, health products. So um, with regards to how that pre-qualification would happen, uh, there is no procedure in place at the moment to pre-qualify monoclonal antibodies for infectious diseases. But that is something that we are working on. Um, it may take um, another few years before we actually have a set of procedures available. Um, uh, we have a, a pilot procedure in place for biosimilars and those biosimilars um, that are part of that pilot procedure happen to be monoclonal antibodies, but that's specifically biosimilars, not originator anti-infective monoclonal antibodies. Um, so in, in probably the next two, three years, we should have something more concrete. And I think respiratory syncytial virus will be probably the first uh, monoclonal antibody that's pre-qualified. If the phase three trials uh, prove that that product is safe and efficacious, and if there is um, commitment from an agency such as Gabby to procure uh, those products for developing countries. And I apologize, but I have to drop off to join another uh, webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. All right. Um, that was great uh, and helpful and good to, good to have Aaron with us. Um, I want to turn potentially the, the final question uh, that we have for the panel, and then we're also very uh, keen to assess if panelists have questions from each other and also turn it to the audience. But the final uh, question from us uh, for you, Pervin. Um, so we've heard um, a lot in, in the webinar today about some of the critical actions that will be needed to create a pathway for monoclonal antibodies for HIV prevention to become accessible. Could you sort of give your perspectives on, on how you and the foundation um, sort of see the urgencies of some of those actions and where, from your perspective, the priorities would lie to help lay the groundwork for the uh, potential future um, rollout of monoclonal antibodies for HIV prevention? Yeah, thank you. And this was a very um, 
encouraging discussion as we've had thus far. So, and also I'm really glad to see, uh, and we all were to see the joint call uh, uh, from uh, uh, by W H uh, by uh, Welcome Trust and IAVI, uh, which was so well uh, articulated by Mark. Um, and so, as you know. Um, ensuring global access is probably a very critical facet of what the foundation's efforts are to have maximal impact. And we build that in into all of our investments and products. Um, and, you know, fortunately, as I think you've heard thus far, we are at this uh, great time in HIV prevention, where there's an emerging landscape, a very nice emerging landscape of prevention tools. And there will be multiple options for women and men in LMICs and vulnerable populations globally. So in that context, I think there is, should be a shared sense of responsibility as well as urgency in the development, uh, delivery, distribution, I think some of the uh, points articulated by Rosemary earlier for access to monoclonal antibodies. And how do we achieve this? I think the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the document that was generated lays it out pretty well. Uh, you know, we should have all of the stakeholders aligned around uh, uh, the uh, level of efficacy we want to see for antibody mediated prevention to focus on the PPC and as the three characteristics that Erin uh, just noted, which are important, we have to define the populations who would benefit most. As Helen mentioned, uh, we, we will have to prioritize. And so um, outlining those would be critical. Uh, more importantly, uh, we should also um, uh, take essential steps uh, to understand the needs of the communities. I will echo what Rosemary said here uh, and make sure that the uh, procurement agencies and, and ministries of health, what would be the most sustainable model uh, to deliver and distribute antibodies without having a significant impact on health systems or cold chain. And again, the PPCs will be very critical to providing that kind of a roadmap. But we always have to keep the end user needs at the forefront. And I hope uh, that aspect is also taken into account in the PPC development. Or PP, yeah, PPC development. So how do we get there? So it, form alliances. Uh, I think it will be critical to have uh, alliances with committed manufacturing partners who will manage product through its life cycle requirements. We haven't really talked about that. And also develop uh, and work with companies to develop local manufacturing uh, and regulatory capacity in LMICs. Um, uh, because I think uh, it's the, for timely distribution and access uh, in LMICs, uh, ideally product approval would happen in LMICs shortly uh, after or almost simultaneously with approvals in high income countries. And I think that will be critical to have uh, rapid uh, deployment of these uh, for vulnerable populations. Um, leaders like Welcome Trust, uh, IAVI, WHO can lay the groundwork um, and uh, to accelerate both development as well as access. And then as been mentioned before, have facilities in place such as the Gavi uh, or now has, as they have developed for COVAX uh, or, or called COVAX for COVID antibodies and other treatments for COVID. Um, so I'll stop there um, in the interest of time. Thank you, Pervin. Really great, very helpful. Um, we do have some time for questions uh, that panelists might have for each other. Bill, I think you did post a, a question in the uh, chat box uh, for Mike, I think. So we would have time for that. And any other questions that panelists would have for each other before we can assess uh, if the audience have questions for the panelists? Hi, this is Bill. Um, yeah, I, I wrote to Mike, I, I don't know how, how important the mystique of having an infusion was, but perhaps you have some sense of that, Mike. Uh, 
I, I think uh, I think in general, um, as, as I think others have said, it, it's going to be easier if we can give whatever we're giving, either I am or sub Q, if that makes sense. It, it's unequivocally easier. <clears throat> uh, I think that the study so and 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 one of the problems is the study subjects felt very altruistic about their contribution. Um, and developed a strong relationship with the people doing infusions. Each infusion took a couple hours at first, got smaller and smaller and smaller. I think Helen's site was certainly one of the sites with Shanae and uh, Delaney, I believe. So th there was a, just a, a spree de corps. Now, whether that esprit de corps would extend to the, I, the distribution of that drug IV if it really becomes a drug, I, I don't know, you know. We have a behavioral research unit led by Michelle Andrasik, who's writing, I think there's, in fact, there's already a paper submitted about the kind of thinking about um, uh, the, the, what, what led to such altruistic behavior. I think this will never work if it's every eight weeks. I think if it's once a year, I can kind of see that people might be willing to spend a couple hours once a year, once every six months. I'm coming up with once a year because some of the companies are arguing that they can make modifications even longer than six months uh, with, and uh, along the lines. I will say one thing to Rosemary that I thought was her very compelling comments about the community. There are no animal monoclonal antibodies in this mix. I mean, we, we need to communicate. There's only, there's only things that we're harvesting from people who've recovered from HIV or companies that are using science to engineer a new monoclonal. There, there's, there's, I think we really need to get, uh, and I think maybe this comes up because the adenovirus vector in um, COVID is a chimp adenovirus and maybe we're creating confusion as they hear about the chimp ad Oxford vaccine. So I. I think that's something we really need to nip in the bud uh, as much as we can. Uh, I'll stop there. Uh, Bill, I hope that answered your question. I don't, there's a manuscript that tries to address your question, but I don't think it can be addressed until such time as we really had a product, to be honest. Could, could I just add something to what uh, Mike had just said and Rosemary might want to come in. I think one of the things we're seeing now, which is of great concern, is this sort of anti-vax uh, sort of framing around COVID vaccines, um, you know, with all sorts of conspiracy theories. Uh, and, and historically, for example, in the African region, we've had very high acceptance of our childhood immunization programs, but we're now seeing this sort of growing uh, negativity. And, you know, a, a recent survey showed a drop in many countries of confidence in particularly COVID vaccines. And I think one of the things we're gonna to have to think about in the HIV field is whether we're going to get a sort of spillover effect, uh, particularly because of people not necessarily understanding a new technology. And uh, that in itself can cause suspicion, but it also gives people who want to spread conspiracy theories and, and false information a field day, because if people don't understand it, you can really say a whole lot of things and that becomes the new reality. So I think that it's something that we really must think about because potentially these, these could be game changers. And, and I think just to underscore, uh, the other thing that came out at last week's discussion was, you know, with Cabellet, do we really need? anything more and the answer is we certainly do because not everything is going to suit everybody at every point in their lives and if we can develop something as Mike has said uh, in the in last week's discussion we said ideally a six month if it was longer would be better um, but we, we with the, the in terms of the preferred product characteristic we said down to three but if we could develop something like this it would it could add to that sort of game-changing array but we have to watch the understanding in the, in the current context um, uh, and the current atmosphere. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come in and just say how so very important it is to utilize this moment and the, the misinformation that is out there as an avenue or a way to create um, more robust um, research literacy programs, especially at um, community level, because we could be clear about the science, but I think when we talk about access, when we talk about acceptability, when we talk about uptick, then it really boils down to public perception and understanding of the product. And I think now is a good time. We have an opportunity to shape that. And what we have seen in many public health 
um, responses is that research literacy or science literacy at the community level can really help to shape that and to dispel the myths and the misinformation. Thanks, Rosemary and Helen. Um, I can take maybe, um, Roche, one more question from the audience, if that works. Yeah, okay. I, I think to, to bring it back to the original report, which was not focusing only on, on HIV prevention, monoclonal antibody for HIV prevention, but the broader use of monoclonal antibody uh, in, in various situations. Can, can we, should we align with the disease and treatment so that they support, the efforts support one another and, and push, push the, the, the approach, as a, I wouldn't say globally, but as a, a, a global tool, um, not as individual as we, have, uh, of, as we often do in the field, as a silo approach, but as a global tool. It, it, would that help? And how do we go about, how do we start that? And, and maybe it's a question starting from, from our pool. No, thank you. Um, I mean, it's a fundamentally important question. Um, when we began the work with Welcome, you know, we knew that there was a problem in terms of uh, global inequities. The more work we did, the more apparent it was that the problem was actually more pronounced than we really appreciated. Um, and it's it's definitely there are so many diseases that are. Uh, you know, of equal prevalence in low-income countries or greater prevalence in low-income countries and middle-income countries that are targeted by vaccines against various non-communicable, I mean, antibodies against various non-communicable diseases like, you know, cancer, which is a global threat in many instances. And, and there really needs to be greater equity achieved in terms of access to monoclonal antibodies, because in many ways that is the cutting edge of biomedical innovation um, these days, and, and we need to have that biomedical innovation benefit people all around the world. You know, our view was that HIV could be the test case that if we could prove it with HIV monoclonal antibodies, then other antibodies could follow that path against other diseases. I think, you know, based on the discussions you've heard today, it may well be that COVID provides the test case, but certainly the combination of the COVID effort and the HIV effort, I think, will get us further down the field for global access to other monoclonal antibodies against other diseases. I think this really puts that issue front and center, and hopefully, collectively, we can deliver solutions that will be broadly applicable. And, you know, our hope is to bring together different stakeholders like the discussion today so that we can raise awareness of these issues and begin to work collectively on solutions uh, that will solve for them. Thank you, Mark. Um, we are reaching uh, the end of, of, of the, uh, the webinar. I'd like to have the last word to, to Bill. And, and Bill, has, uh, you have seen many, many options, many things, many things, many years. So how optimistic are you about the future of monoclonal antibody for HIV prevention? One minute. <laughs> Um, I don't know, because we haven't heard the, the results from, from AMP yet, uh, exactly how fast this will happen. I imagine it will happen. Um, and there are, there's a, like a, like in the poem, a mile to go before we sleep. But, um, I do think that the, the notion that monoclonal antibodies are useful uh, for other diseases that people in the developing world really suffer from and care about um, is an important one. Um, and I also recognize how hard it is to get people to advocate um, for an approach or a platform as opposed to a, 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 an immediate need for a particular problem that they're having. Um, and so um, I, I, I do think that that some of the diseases where, where antibodies are getting cheaper and where they have a, a, a therapeutic effect um, is really going to help us in the long run. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm going to hand over for, to Esther for closing this webinar and then I have a final few words. All right. Thank you, Roger. And thank you again to all the panelists, speakers, and those in attendance. I hope you found it not only in, informative in terms of enriching uh, knowledge as to what needs to happen to make monoclonal antibodies broadly accessible, but I also hope it inspired you 
to 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 action, uh, which is what we're ultimately needed, and ways we can collaborate to make this happen. For those of you who mentioned a few times, you're working both on HIV and COVID. I just want to raise that there is. Uh, a few other webinars coming up that are focused more on access to COVID antibodies, future COVID antibodies, anyone's interested, I would say, please uh, look out for an announcement on the IAFI website for uh, that the series of webinars. The first one is 11 December, and I'll turn it back to you, Roger. Uh, thank you, Esther. And uh, I might turn uh, to thank the panelists, the attendees. I also would like to advertise one of our next webinar. Uh, which, will be, which will be looking at the impact of the ARM studies on uh, what I would call classical immunology and especially trial design. Uh, there have already been a, a number of conversations uh, taking place. Um, I would like to close by uh, thanking uh, my, my partner at IAVI. Uh, this webinar was organized in, in collaboration partnership with them. Uh, we hope you have uh, enjoyed this hour and a quarter. Uh, thank you all, and we hope to meet again to continue this very important discussion. Thank you.